What was the issue that you were looking at here in these children with cerebral palsy? Previously, we had studied the participation of children with cerebral palsy in Spain, but in a quantitative way. So we would like to deeper this construct with a qualitative approach. So we, uh, we have uh, done uh, focus groups with children uh, to explore their perception about participation in leisure activities. And you were giving the children questions and you were getting their answers. What sorts of things did they tell you? Yes, we asked them about uh, which kind of activity they have participated in the uh, past uh, four weeks and uh, which kind of support they needed for to participate in these activities and if it's it's possible which kind of change they needed to participate in these activities. And last, we asked them about which uh, uh, experience about facilitators and barriers to participate in leisure activities. Obviously, it's good for these children to participate as much as possible. So did they give you some good clues about what's best to do? Yes, I think this, this content of this research is very uh, important for the Spanish uh, PT and other health professionals because with this model that's presented in the journal, we can see clearly which we need to do to promote participation. We need to uh, promote the facilitators to, to get more uh, involvement of the children and we need to work together uh, to eliminate the barriers of the environment. You said barriers of the environment. Now, I, I think we tend to think that children with cerebral palsy are limited by their physical limitations. But you found that a lot of other things were important, didn't you? Yes, yes, it's very interesting because the main barriers uh, did not relate uh, did not relate to a uh, physical aspect of the children it's more related to the attitude environment or social environment uh, it's it's very important because we need to uh, to look at the context uh, where the children are living because we can change it and if we change we can promote more participation when you said attitudes, could you give me some examples of negative attitudes and positive attitudes to help these children? Sure. Uh, I remember one girl, uh, seven years old, uh, GMFCS level one, and she told, I, I love uh, play with my friends in the community, but some of them uh, didn't want to play with me because my hand and my foot is different. So it's a, it's a way, uh, it's, it's her feelings about be or not included in the society. So it's a, it's a way to, to, to feel a negative attitude. In the other hand, some children related a very motivated aspects of their, their peers in the school because the children motivated them to participate in trips in the school. So it's, a, it's another way to conduct uh, attitude and promoting participation. Now, if you identify something like that, that the attitude is the way other people, other children are reacting to this child, what practically could you do about this? Yes, uh, there are a lot of programs for a uh, change attitude. It's a, it's a behavior, so you can change. And there are some problems, some, some programs, educational programs that may be conducted into the community, into the school. So the first step is to know the problem. So we need to talk about it. Uh, the children need to talk. I want to play, so I can play. I can play in a different way, but I, I would like to play with my peers without disability. So it's, a, it's their uh, right to do it. So I think our job, our uh, main uh, effort must be in this sense, to talk about and to promote change in the uh, health service, 
in the schools, in the community. So I think it's a, it's a very important uh, step. What are the practical steps that individual physical therapists could be doing? The first uh, thing is to change our uh, model of training because our training is uh, mainly focused on body function and body structure. And sometimes we cannot change it in some children. So we need to look deeper and broadly to other aspects of the children's lives. And with, uh, we are incorporating the contest evaluation in our rehabilitation setting, we can change it and we can promote it more participation for children with disabilities. If you were to sum up then the uh, basic take home message in just a few words, how would you sum that up? The most important thing is uh, considerate the environment. It's a very important piece of the treatment for children with cerebral palsy. So we can uh, do uh, our treatment uh, focusing on body function and body structure, but not only in this aspect. You need to look where the children are living and their experience, because maybe we can have more uh, positive uh, results modifying the contest, no modifying the body of the children. Linda, uh, the uh, piece here I want to play, it's all about children playing. And of course, if you have children with any impairment or cerebral palsy in this particular case, playing with many children is very important to them. What did you make of this very interesting research we've just been listening to? I loved the uh, fact that they spoke directly to the children, um, older children and ask their opinion about what were barriers for them and what were facilitators for them in terms of engaging in and around their environment. Because often I think as pediatric therapists, we get very used to talking with mom and dad or grandma and grandpa or with the caretaker person who brings the child to, to therapy, or even if we're in their home or school, we're used to talking to the caretaker. And it seems natural to do that, but in fact, uh, more natural to actually speak to the child and ask the child because often their perceptions are very different from their parents or their caretaker um, and sometimes uh, fuller, if not different, uh, they're fuller. What for you were the important messages coming out of this then? The important message that resonates even more so today in the context that we find ourselves in the United States, is that the, our perceptions of others as being same or different are so key to how we behave and how they behave, which I think is quite important. So we behave in a certain way, but then the people we're behaving with, we change their behavior also. And I think it's so critical for children, particularly as they're developing self-image, which is always, we're always developing self-image, to have reflected in the people's, uh, people around them that they are kids and they want to play and they want to participate in the world with their peers and with other people around them. And how we behave with them and in response to them is so key to how they behave within their environment. Egmar was talking about the environment. She was excited because the environment, including people's attitudes, can be modified. What kind of ideas do you have of just how physical therapists can benefit in improving their therapy to help the environment to be modified and attitudes perhaps to be changed? Well, this is a little bit of my bias about intervention in general, um, but there is a uh, kind of a theoretical framework called perception action theory, which was started by the Gibsons um, and quite a long time ago, in which you look at the fit between the person or the animal, whoever you're studying, and the environment. And you look at how did those two features, two characteristics, two variables, fit together? Do they fit well? 
Uh, do they fit poorly? And if they fit well, you may see the kinds of behaviors that are functional and helpful to them. If they fit poorly, then as therapists, we're often focused on trying to change the person as opposed to, well, wait a minute, we have to change this fit. Right. And you're, go you're going to change the set. And how might you do that? It sounds rather difficult to me. Well, sometimes it's simple. I mean, I use an example when I talk with people about this, that if you hand a child a pencil and it's oriented in the horizontal position, you're going to get them to reach this way. If you orient the pencil in the vertical position, you're going to get them to at least try to move their hand into the uh, vertical position. Now, they may not be able to do that, but here's the here's the vertical pencil. Now you could actually shape it by moving it a little bit more towards what they could do. We call that kind of the just right challenge. But you're shaping the environment. You're not doing anything to the child. You're creating an environment in which the child might move their hand in a different direction. And, and what other children say and do and think about the child who has an impairment is very important. How might that be changed? Well, it's very key, and I think it really is a reflection of parent attitude um, and family attitudes, and those are taught. I don't believe those are necessarily inherent. Uh, those are taught. Attitudes are taught to people, how we behave around people that look different. We talk about it. We don't hide it. We talk about it. Yep, they do. They look different from us. They have a slightly different arm or they walk a little bit differently, but everybody walks a little differently. Um, you know, let's look at how you walk. Let's look at how I walk. And I think accepting that people have differences, they're people, they're children inside, and they want to participate with you too. And I think those key messages must come from family, friends, and the context of, in, of the environmental context of society. Mm -hmm.